Okay, Shabbat Shalom everyone. So we're going to look at the life of Simon Peter, or in Hebrew or Aramaic, his name was Shimon Kifa, his nickname given to him by Yeshua. So by trade, he was a fisherman who worked with his brother Andrew. They both, that's how they both earned their living. Um, according to scholars, it, they grew up in two possible locations, Capernaum or Beth Sadia, near a lake called Gennesaret in the Galilee region. Apart from being fisherman, Shimon was a disciple of John the Immerser. I'm pretty sure it was along with his brother as well. So we find in John uh, 1 35 42, which provides us a background of his spiritual education. This information alludes to the idea that Shimon was given a rabbinical um, education under John the Baptist, and possibly an Essene education as well. So we know that John the Baptist from our previous talk was a real prominent Jewish figure. People loved him. He obviously had some credentials to take on disciples, and we have a picture here of two of our great, you know, the, the 12 being mentored previously by John the Baptist. So there's a bit of a sharing of heritage there. It's great. Um, it was while they were at work fishing out on the lake one day that Yeshua officially invites them into his rabbinical school and offers to teach them by asking them to follow him. It was common in the Second Temple period for Jewish people to have two names. Simon Peter was no exception. His Hebrew name, Shimon, which means listen or hear or obey, which is where we get Shema Israel, the Shema prayer. So he's literally the one who hears, does, and obeys. That's 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 how it was called in Hebrew. Um, his second name, his nickname was Kepha in Aramaic, which is translated as rock, which is a, which is actually a stumbling rock. You can make a pun of uh, in some you know Catholic Christian uh, circles where they think that on the rock of him himself the word will be built, but it was just using his name on this rock, referring to him as rock instead of his name, Shimon. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting to note that Yeshua gave nicknames to his disciples and this was something that was done in the Second Temple period. That was just a part of their camaraderie and intimacy of disciple and Talmudim, or disciples and rabbi. Um, so his ministry, um, Shimon was not just a disciple of Yeshua. He was one of the sent ones to bring good news of the coming of Messiah to the Jews and bring the uh, the Gentiles into the Messianic kingdom as well. Uh, furthermore, he's given a place of authority amongst the Messianic believing community. As one whose yes or no carries considerable authority, and we can find this in Matthew. Um, he talks about that. Shimon became the head of the movement post Yeshua's ascension into heaven. He is mentioned before as mentioned before, was given authority to make rabbinic legal decisions or halachic decisions and focus the course of development of the sect. He was accompanied by his wife and he would often go out and make proselytes of the Gentiles and partake in the work of the Great Commission, preaching the good news and perform healings. Um, Peter's home became one of the primary meeting places of the disciples in the early days of our sect. So, this is, in a sense, a reflection of Hasidic Judaism today, where they have a righteous leader, and often it's in a familiar way, or you, you have like a, a passing over the mantle. And for instance, Chabad Lubavitch, there's this thing called a Chabad house, and that's the house of their rabbi. So, being Jewish, we're, we're no different, you know, as in sectarian wise, we're a, a reflection of something present in the Second Temple and something that would later be established as a revival movement could say. So there's some foreshadowings of some things there. Shimon was viewed by some of the early church fathers as being a Jew and practicing the Jewish faith. Contrary to some modern church scholarship, the early Clementine movement depicted Shimon as more of a Pharisee than a modern day Christian. They commented on his love for the Torah and his fearing of God, uh, sorry, referring to God as one which is in accordance with Torah and Judaism. So he, the early Christians looking back did not see him as a Catholic early church leader at all. They saw him as an observant Jew. And this is, this is no, um, it's not like it's hidden in Catholic, you know, scholarly writings. This is just how they saw him, which is quite bizarre as he's being betrayed as a 
Christian saint, so it's, it's strange to me. Um, we worship one God, the maker of the universe, and observe his law by which we are commanded first to keep, sorry, to worship him and reserve his name. So they're just drawing a parallel to other Jewish ideas at the time, and this was a saying taken from that time, and it parallels the description of Shimon really well. And ten, to honor our parents, preserve chastity and uprightness. Again, things that the early church and other writers attributed to Shimon Kiefer was this very Jewish idea of charity, righteousness, honoring your parents, following the Torah. In fact, that was from Recognite, Recognitions, which is, I think is a Catholic kind of uh, study or, um, yeah, they kind of gave teachings on it. And it's a, a book of, like, a theological book of theirs. But he's especially insistent on prohibition against eating with the Gentiles unless they be baptized and on abstaining from the table of the devils, that is, from blood offered to idols and from dead carcasses, from animals suffocated or torn by wild beasts and from blood. He insists also upon washing after every pollution and upon the observance of the Levitical purifications by both sexes. So this is homilies, which is that theological book. So this is the Catholics commenting on their St. Peter saying, he's pretty much your average Orthodox Jew or ultra-Orthodox, if you want to use that misnomer. But yeah, so where we get this from in the modern church is, is a strange idea. Um, what else have we got? Peter was... Um, he partook in the making of Gentile converts to Messianic Judaism, and after having his famous dream, which he was told not to partake in non-kosher food, which is a metaphor for the understanding that the Holy Spirit makes unclean human beings clean in the eyes of God. He used the seven Noahide laws as a criteria for Gentiles to convert into um, the congregation. So I'm kind of giving my own piecing things together on this, but... Back in the Second Temple Judaism, you could go to the synagogues, you could go to the temple, and you could be trained without being circumcised fully per se in Judaism. You weren't necessarily seen as a full covenantal member. I think there's a slight discrepancy there, in, or rather a new innovation on the part of Messianic Judaism to say, yes, you can. But as far as Judaism across the board, Gentiles were allowed to practice. So I've kind of pieced this all together that this is our kind of if you want to become a Messianic believer, this is your base roots. And Shimon Kiefer was championing that cause. If you want to know the God of Israel, all you have to do is these things and we'll teach you more. It was quite evangelical for their time, which is kind of, I guess, flies in the face of modern Orthodox Judaism, considering he was a modern Orthodox Jew for his time. So, oh, was it? Yeah, well, ancient Orthodox Jew. Um, <clears throat> many early church fathers considered Shimon as... Uh, Shimon's religious practice to match the Essenes, a sect of Pharisees who lived during the Second Temple period. They described his behavior as being rabbinical in the way he prays, the food laws he abides by, and the use of water for purifications, such as the use of the mikvah or immersion and the washing of hands, both of which were part of Pharisee Judaism. So, again, just more confirmation of the opposite of what is uh, believed today. Shimon is also mentioned in a few rabbinical works and is actually accredited with a comp contribution to Orthodox Jewish liturgy. A quote by Rabbi Yehuda Chassid paints Shimon in a good light in the eyes of Judaism, however with a perspective of one who is misrepresented on behalf of Judaism by the church. So he sees him as kind of a, a figure that's been taken against his will, almost a captive, and betrayed as something he's not, so, yeah. Um, the conclusion of the rabbi's comments that Shimon was a righteous Jew who was given the title Tzadik, which implies a pious person who can bring people closer to God. So, back in the Second Temple, you attach yourself to a holy rabbi and you followed his teachings, for instance, Yeshua, Rabbi Hillel, some people chose um, Shammai, there's a myriad of others. But people in their time saw this man, Shimon Kiefer, as someone, hey, if we follow him, we will be drawn closer to God because he's so righteous and holy himself. That was a common thought amongst some Jews. 
Rabbi Yehuda says, if a Jew converts to Christianity, we refer to him with a derogatory nickname. For example, if his name was Avraham, we call him Afram, which means from afar or dust, or something similar. We do this even to a tzaddik, a righteous Jewish person, if the Christians venerate him like Shimon Kifa, who was a righteous man but Christians appropriated him, venerated him as one of their saints, and gave him the surname Simon Peter. Even though he was a righteous man at Tzadik, the Jews gave him the nickname of Peter Chamor, or firstling of a donkey. So it's a play on words. So even though it wasn't his fault, they considered it as if he had committed the act of converting to Christianity. But it was the Roman Catholic Church at the time taking a really powerful religious figure and saying, no, he's one of us, he's one of us. And it's a little bit of slander and lies going on there. Um, Jewish scholars give credence to the authorship of a famous prayer prayed every Shabbat morning in Orthodox prayer seders as being written by Shimon Kifa. So this isn't just Messianic scholars, this is the Talmud, this is Judaism in general, says, yeah, he, he wrote this prayer. The grandson of the famous Jewish scholar, Rabbi Rashi, speaks highly of Shimon and declares that he is a wise and, ve and very learned in the Torah, and it attributes to him the position of songs and hymns, Shimon also composed a prayer that is used in Orthodox liturgy known as Eten Tafila, I shall give praise, which is prayed on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. That is how influential in, his, in actual historical content Messianic Judaism was in its time. It was first and foremost a, a forerunner in um, the world to come in Messianic Judaism and all those kinds of things. It was leading the way. It was a part of the, the greater sects of Judaism. One of the disciples of Rashi, known as the Machsor Viti, writes that Shimon did indeed compose the prayer for Yom Kippur and his prayer is continued to be used on the Jewish holiday until today. According to Rashi, the ninth of Tibet is a day that is set aside to mourn for this righteous tzaddik who died and lived a Jew in their liturgy uh, and now increasingly evident shows he lived uh, a Jewish life while being a disciple of Yeshua. So the fact that they pray for the redemption of his soul, expound on that a little bit, they pray that he'll be delivered from this apostasy, that he'll come back to Judaism. That's how much they loved him at the time. He was just this great saintly figure. And he also composed a really, really prominent prayer on the Shabbat, uh, Shabbat to do a called the Mishnah prayer. And it's a long psalm-like praise of thanksgiving and praising God. So, yeah, about the life of Shimon Kifa, the Orthodox Jew. Yeah. So I just have an interesting comment as well. Mm -hmm. As you bring up um, Simon Peter into such a, you know, like the Jewish people really um, look him up as, in such a big light, how in Christianity we painted him as a lack of faith person. Yes. Um, talking about when he stepped out of the boat and that he, you know, didn't make quite make it to Yeshua. Yeah, yeah. He was sinking and it, you he know, little faith. we always portray him as, you know, don't you like Simon Peter? He had little faith. But actually, we should be like him because in reality, he had such a big influence and he yeah. was such a you know, I think that some people look, view him as in the rank of disciples, not so high mm. because of that one comment. But in reality, he's such a big persona. Yeah, I mean, it, all, all these sources I got here, some are messianic, but if you look up um, Simon the Just or the brother of Yeshua in um, the Jewish encyclopedia, this rabbi writes almost as if he's one of their ancient sages. It's, they just owned him, and they considered him to be such a highly faithful person. And mm. it's my suspicion that Yeshua was trying to stretch and test his faith because of his righteousness, <laughs> because of who he needed him to be. So, yeah. Yes. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks, thanks, Ryan.